welcome to my summer book haul part one because you know there's gonna be a part two because your girl has no self-control. It's just who I am as a person. You may also notice that we have a special guest for this book haul and that is my fan. I'm sorry if you can hear it droning on in the background but it is extremely hot here in Scotland today and it is 75% humidity so if I don't have the fan on I'm gonna die right here on camera. I tried it without the fan but I turned a very unsightly purple colour. So my summer book haul has been split into two parts. The first part I am going to just call general fiction because it is essentially everything which doesn't fit into part two which is going to be a crime corner book haul full of mystery and thrillers and murder. The sheer amount of genre variety in part one of this haul is definitely going to illustrate how messy it is inside of my brain. The first book that I have to show you is The Poppy War by R.F. Kwong. You will probably already have seen this somewhere on booktube if you like fantasy because it has taken everybody by storm. Seriously, I do not have a single friend who has read this and not completely loved it. Therefore, my expectations are very high. This book follows Fang Runin. She is somewhat predictably an orphan and she exists in a world which is absolutely ravaged by opium. The drug is everywhere and in fact her new adopted family actually smuggle it. But one day that adopted family tells Fang that she is going to be sold into an arranged marriage and Fang is having none of this. In fact, I think it's safe to say that Fang's reaction to this is possibly the best reaction I have ever seen to an arranged marriage, she decides that she's going to fight her way into the most prestigious military academy that her world has and learn to use drug filled shamanic powers to fight in a war. Shh. I'm so excited. The three books I have to show you are fairly similar in theme so I will show you them back to back and the first one is The House Between Tides by Sarah Main. This is my most recent acquisition and when I walked into the bookstore and read the tagline on the back I could not put it back down. It says, This is the captivating story of a crumbling estate in the wilds of Scotland, its century old secret and an enduring mystery. So basically it said, Leanne, buy me Leanne, buy me. And I did because you should always listen to the voices in your head. That was a problematic joke. This one begins with Hetty Davro in the present day. She has decided that she's going to leave her strange relationship and London behind and head back to Scotland to her family's estate. But when she gets there, she finds that it is in drastic need of repair. Amidst the renovation, she then uncovers a very big secret. So it's a bit of a departure for me. Usually my literary fiction involves some sort of, you know, stabby murder as previously discussed but I'm very much looking forward to it, as long as it doesn't try to be Outlander without the time travel. The book that is very similar in theme to that one is Kate Morton's most recent release, which I have this beautiful proof of. This is The Clockmaker's Daughter. I can't resist a Kate Morton. I don't want to say that they're formulaic because that implies that they are not good and that is not the truth, but they do all follow some very similar patterns. Almost all of them involve an old country estate or a big old house which becomes a character in its own right. There's always a mystery which ties a lot of disparate people to it and usually there's a narrative which goes back and forth in time. And this one is no different. This one begins in 1862 in Birchwood Manor when Edward Radcliffe brings a bunch of artists and artistic types to have an entire month of painting and drawing and merrymaking. The inside flap of the book says that Edward suggests when they get there that the house is haunted but that it really wasn't haunted until they left because when they did two women were dead and a priceless heirloom was missing possibly forever. 150 years later, see I told you back and forward in time, we pick it up with Elodie who is an archivist in London and she finds some artifacts related to Birchwood Manor and decides to investigate what really happened. This one comes out on the 20th of September so I will be reading it very soon and letting you guys know what I think even though it is a massive chunker as all of Kate Morton's books are just 
FYI. Oh, and if you need a recommendation for where to go with Kate Morton after this, I always say return order, so start with the house at Riverton. The next one that I have here is entirely Kirsty inspired. I was going on about how I haven't found an urban fantasy series which adequately deals with ghosts for me. I mean the Mercy Thompson series by Patricia Briggs definitely touches on it in a very satisfying way. I don't feel like I've ever read an urban fantasy series which really adequately explores ghostly goings on and so Kirsty recommended this one. This is The Screaming Staircase by Jonathan Stroud. It is the first in a completed, can we just take a moment, a completed urban fantasy YA series called Lockwood and Co. I think I'm right in thinking that this one is set in a quasi alternative Victorian London wherein ghosts have become something of an epidemic. With psychic criminal investigation cases on the rise, lots of agencies have popped up to deal with this problem. And I love the way the book jacket describes it. It says the smallest, most ramshackle, but arguably the best of these agencies is Lockwood & Co. But it turns out that Lockwood & Co is not exactly a conventional agency because none of the members are technically adults. I am promised ghosts, swashbuckling and lots of female agency and I am very much looking forward to diving into this one. Speaking of urban fantasy, I finally picked up the two books that I was missing in the Kate Daniels series. So this is book 8, Magic Shifts and this is book 9, Magic Binds. Obviously I can't tell you very much about these two books because they are so far along in the series but in case you have never heard of the Kate Daniels series before, it is an urban fantasy series set in Atlanta which has magical shifts. So when when the magic is up, cars refuse to start, guns won't fire, technology doesn't work and all of the little beasties and nasty things can go crawling around the city, people can cast spells etc and then when the magic is down there are a lot of problems left over from when people were casting spells and things. Speaking of urban fantasy, the next one that I have is also a Kirsty recommendation and it is Scythes by Neil Schusterman. Can you tell how difficult it is for me to say all of that together? Yes. This one is set in an alternate reality wherein we have a perfect world and nobody has to die. Except that the planet can't actually support the amount of people who are now living immortally on it and so we have scythes. They are professionals who exist to glean the population of the few people who have been chosen to die to ease the burden. In this first novel, in this first novel and what I think is a trilogy, I know book two is out already, we follow Citra and Rowan who are apprentice scythes and who have to learn to cope with choosing their victims and dispatching them. The next one that I have, oh look, it's another recommendation from Kirsty. This might, this might be a theme, it might be a theme now. But I am extremely pumped to try this one. This is My Sister Rosa by Justine Larbalesti and it is about 17 year old Che who knows unequivocally that his younger sister is a functioning sociopath. He's the only one who knows and he's also the only one that Rosa tells all of her truth to. What she's up to, what she feels, what she believes, what she's going to do. When Che and Rosa's parents move them to New York City, Che realises that Rosa has a lot more opportunities in front of her to do things which are not okay and so he starts trying to get her to make bargains but Rosa likes to keep to the absolute letter of those bargains. Absolute letter. Yeah! I'm so excited. It sounds amazing. It makes me feel really gross and also it is why a Australian fiction which is something that I love dearly. The next one that I have to show you sounds like it has the potential to be the creepiest horror book that I have ever read. And I am crossing my fingers that it is so because it comes from the very unlikely source of Sarah Perry, as in the author of The Essex Serpent. I was sent this one from Serpent's Tale. This is a proof copy. <laughs> the premise is that 20 years ago, Helen Franklin did something which she has never been able to forgive herself 
for and she has spent all of her time since then trying to not remember the thing that she did. And then one day, for reasons that I won't get into, she comes into possession of a manuscript and that manuscript talks about a figure. A tall, silent woman in black with unblinking eyes and bleeding feet. Melmoth, the loneliest being in the world. Condemned to walk the earth forever, she tries to beguile the guilty and lure them away for a lifetime wandering alongside her. Helen is, of course, extremely sceptical about this strange manuscript which has landed in her lap, but then she starts to feel like she's being watched. This one comes out in October. I will probably not be reading it until September so that I can get the full amount of creepiness from the Dark Nights. Will it please be, can I have Dark Nights from September? I would like it actually to be dark at 10 o'clock again. Please. I hate summer. The second to the last one that I have to show you is Undead Girl Gang by Lily Anderson. This is another urban fantasy YA about Mila Flores and I love the way she's described in the book jacket. It says she could truly not care less what you think about her Doc Martens, her attitude or her weight because she knows that no matter what her BFF Riley is right by her side. But then Riley, along with a few other very popular and bitchy girls from school, is murdered. Mila is then told by all of the adults in her life that surely Riley was involved in a suicide pact with the other girls, but she knows that this is absolutely never, ever something that Riley would have contemplated. And so she decides that the only way she's ever going to get the truth is if she raises Riley from the dead and asks her herself. It is high on my TBR. The last one that I have to show you is another high fantasy, although it is YA high fantasy this time, and it is Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. This is another one which is absolutely blown up booktube, and I was on a trip recently to Lincoln and feeling a little bit sorry for myself and decided to buy this to cheer myself up. As previously mentioned, I have been enjoying fantasy recently which does not have a purely western setting and this one is set in an alternative Africa where there used to be magic, there used to be magic which ruled the lands, but that magic has gone away. This one follows Zeli who lives in an alternative Africa without any magic. Magic has been removed by a ruthless king who has targeted it to try and keep himself on the throne and in power but Zeli, her mother and a few other individuals still know how to harness the magic and want to bring it back. But as the very short back of this book says, they killed my mother, they took our magic, they tried to bury us, now we rise. I don't think things are going to go well for Zeli in the beginning of this novel. But I am very hopeful that by the end of it she kicks ass and I am wholly on her side. So that is everything for part one of my summer book haul. I hope that you enjoyed seeing all of the randomness that I have picked up over the last couple of months. As I said, I will be back for part two, which will be purely crime corner books, so mysteries, thrillers. In the meantime, if you have read any of these books or if you are excited for any of these books, please chat to me about it in the comments and I will speak to you guys soon. Bye!